by being disrespectful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because you are not pleased with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. You are not pleased with the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. And what you need to think when you see these ni'am, these blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to other people, say, Alhamdulillah, may Allah put barakah in it for them. Because sometimes they might be tested and trialed with some of these. Because many brothers today, young youngsters that can see this masjid at the age of 18, 15, 14, whenever Allah guides one, you have this hamasa, you have this, you know, it's like you've been given this Duracell battery, it's just been put inside you. Okay, and you have this battery that has been put inside you and all you want to do is just worship Allah Azza wa Jal and obey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and completely forget about things. But then because of this, because of ignorance and because maybe bad companionship, you become extreme in affairs where maybe you can be the cause of making your own family members be put off the deen. So that which you're practicing is khair, is good. However, at the same time, the issue is that you were extreme in those affairs. So maybe you chased away your loved ones that you wanted to what? Try to guide us. أيا طالب العلم قم لتنم فإن الزمان انقضى وانصرم فكن ما حييت ضنينا به فظنك بالوقت عين الكرم وكن حلس درسك وافرح به تكن قائدا في غد للأمم وبادر شبابك من قبل أن يقطع عزمك سيف الهرم. Okay. So بإذن الله تعالى we'll give a brief understanding of these rights even though there are more rights than what I will mention I will mention some of the most important ones so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we know he was given Jawami'ul Kalim yani he was given the ability to pass on a powerful message with a small amount of words and you will see this from the hadith that I will mention that which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us and taught us Sahaba radiallahu anhu the Prophet ﷺ, he taught us how to interact with our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. Our Muslim, our brothers and sisters in faith. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned, لا تحاسدوا ولا تناجشوا ولا تباغضوا ولا تدابروا ولا يبيع بعضكم على بيع بعض وكونوا عباد الله إخوانا. المسلم وأخو المسلم لا يظلمه ولا يخذله ولا يحقر بحسب امرئ من الشر أن يحقر أخاه المسلم كل المسلم على المسلم حرام دمه وماله وعرضه It's a very very powerful hadith The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He's telling us certain things we should totally avoid And you will see that the main thing that kind of combines all of these things together is harming your fellow Muslim brother or sister Right? The things that the Prophet ﷺ is telling us to avoid are the things that will inflict some type of harm in one way or another. And you will see that this is one of the foundational principles of Islam. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger وسلم, in many different ahkam, rulings, they tell us and they make us stay away from things that will either physically, verbally, maybe mentally have some type of harm on your fellow Muslim brother, your fellow Muslim sister, or even those that are not even considered to be Muslim, right? Okay. The Prophet sallallahu he mentioned, he said, لا تحاسدوا Do not be from those who have hasid of each other. Now what is hasid? Hasid, the ulama have explained it to be, is that you, you dislike or you want زوال نعمة الله عن الغير You want this blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon your Muslim brother or your Muslim sister to be removed. Ibn Taymiyyah, he describes it in a different way. He describes it as karahiyatu ni'matillahi or karahiyatu ma an'am Allahu ala ghayrik or ala al ghayr. It's that you dislike and you hate that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to someone else other than you. You see that beautiful car that your Muslim brother he drives, that beautiful house your, fellow, your Muslim brother he has bought, maybe he started a new job, Maybe he's invested in a few investments and they may came out to be fruitful for him. Or you see him that he is a person who tries his best to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or even this might enter into the circles of knowledge where you have hasid of your 
Rather because he is able to memorize more than you Or he's, he is Sadi al-Fahm He understands things a lot quicker He's able to read things a lot quicker than you So he develops a lot faster than you So you have this type of hasid in your heart Now why is this considered to be such a dangerous thing? When in reality the thing about hasid is that it eats you up more than the other person It has a negative effect upon you a lot of the time More than the other person The poet he says أَلَا قُلْ لِمَنْ كَانَ لِي حَاسِدًا أَتَدْرِ عَلَى مَنْ أَسَأْتَ عَلَيْهِ الْأَدَبِ أَسَأْتَ عَلَى اللَّهِ فِي فِعْلِهِ لِأَنَّكَ لَمْ تَرْضَ لِي مَا وَهَبْ The poet he says, do you know who you are being disrespectful to? You are being disrespectful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala أَتَدْرِ عَلَى مَنْ أَسَأْتَ عَلَيْهِ الْأَدَبِ Right? You are being disrespectful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Why? Because you are not pleased with that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. You are not pleased with the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed. And what you need to think when you see these ni'am, these blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to other people, say alhamdulillah, may Allah put barakah in it for them. Because sometimes they might be tested and trialed with some of these, these blessings. A person might be trialed through their wealth. Why? Because on the day of judgment, they will be responsible for this wealth. The aim a person has, they may be trialed with that knowledge they have. That beautiful recitation, the ability to recite the Qur'an in a beautiful way, this might be a form of a trial for a person. Why? Because when he comes and he stands and he recites and he leads the people in salah and taraweeh, who is he beautifying his voice for? Is it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is he doing it to impress the people? This seeking of knowledge and this spreading of knowledge, this thing that he posts, you see him posting on social media, making videos, posting content, posting um, yani, uh, quotes from the scholars and spreading it. What's the real reason behind why he is doing this? Is it for the sake of Allah? Is it to get more followers? So sometimes a person might be trialed with the ni'mah that they have been given. Or sometimes it might even be something known as istidraj. What's istidraj? And the ulama of the Salaf, they would be scared of something like this. Istidraj is when a person, he is deep within the sin and the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yet, he keeps on getting the blessings of Allah, time after time. Blessings in his wealth, in his wife, in his children, in his health. And all of this will come and be a evidence against him on the Day of Judgment. Why? Because he was not Abdun Shakur. He was not a grateful slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's get back to this. The Prophet وسلم, is telling us to not have hasid of our fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. Our hearts should be clean and pure towards our fellow, fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. And one of the best ways to cure hasid is to make dua for your brother. If you see that he has something khair, something good that you want and you would want in your life, ask Allah to put barakah in it and ask Allah to reward you with that which is khair for you and to bless you in that which is khair for you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said La tanajashu Do not do something known as najash What is najash? Najash, I'll give you an example yani To make it clearer A man, he is selling a product Let's say for example, he's selling an iPhone for a thousand pound A customer comes in And says, okay, I'll buy it off you for a thousand pound And then another person who's sitting inside of the shop he raises the price, not because he wants to buy it, but because he wants to inflict some type of harm, monetary harm upon the person, and he wants his friend, who's the buyer, to benefit. So he increases and he says, no, I'll buy it off you for, for 110, or 1,100 pounds. And then the other person says, I'll buy it off you for 1,200. Then he says, no, I'll buy it off you for 1,300. Up until he raises it to 2,000 pounds, and the guy sitting in the shop, he says, forget it, I don't even want to buy it. Now they've agreed upon 2,000 pounds. And the only reason he increased the price was because he wanted his friend, who's the, who's the one who's selling the product, to benefit. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us to avoid this, to not do this. Why? Because this harms your fellow Muslim brother and sister. This is haram. Something we should stay away from. The Prophet ﷺ, he also said, لا تباغضوا Do not hate each other. Do not hate your fellow Muslim brother or your fellow Muslim sister. Even if they have oppressed you, if they have oppressed you, it is better for you to forgive them and overlook it and use that as, a, as an ibrah, as a, as a lesson 
So you don't fall into that trap again. But then your heart will be clean towards your fellow Muslim brother and sister. And what's the importance of this? You will see the importance of this on the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does He say about the people who enter Jannah? وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلٍ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرُورٍ مُتَقَابِلِينَ that we have taken out of their hearts that enmity and that hatred and that bughd and you know that animosity that they have towards their Muslim brothers and sisters and they are upon recliners facing each other like brothers, like kin it's haram upon you to enter Jannah if you have some type of hatred or enmity or animosity in your heart towards your fellow Muslim brother or sister imagine this on the day of judgment the day يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ A day which wealth, your children, your status, all of these things then in the dunya will not benefit you except for your good deeds. Imagine you have come out of your grave and you see people running in many different directions. Why? Because of the state of fear they're in. You see the sun has come down and people are drowning in their sweat. You can see the believers and they, they are those who are under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have seen those that have been dragged on their faces and thrown into the hellfire. And you have been allowed to drink from the hawd, the, the lake or the pond that was given to the Prophet Sallallahu Allah, He gave you an easy, an easy reckoning and you were able to pass that. You were able to go over the sirat, the path that's on top of the hellfire. And you were able to pass that very easily. But yet there's one thing that's stopping you from entering into your, your real home, Jannah. Which is that bull, that animosity you have in your heart towards your brother and sister. Then you will be placed on a place known as the Qantara. You will not pass that station until all of your problems are solved. So wouldn't you want to completely overstep that station in the hereafter? And have that feeling removed from your heart in this dunya? So you don't have to wait until you can enter Jannah in the hereafter. So you as a Muslim, you should be a person who loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And we're going to and come with this towards the end of this muhadra. Um, you should be a person who has a qalbun salim, a good heart to his fellow Muslim brother and his fellow Muslim sister. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he also said, وَلَا تَدَابَوْا Do not turn your backs towards each other. Now, a tadabur, it can either be Ma'anawi or hissi. Yani it can either be um, a meaning that is non tangible, I think it's the best way to translate it, where it's an inner, inward feeling, where you have differed over an issue and then you guys start to separate and go your different ways. You guys stop talking to each other, right? You guys don't have the same relationship as you had before. Why? Because you differed over something minute. Something that's not from the usul of Islam, something that's not from the usul of Ahl Sunnah, something that's any dunya related. So you start to cut each other off. The Prophet ﷺ is telling us to avoid this. Or it can be that which relates to within the majalis, where you come and you gather with your brothers or you gather with your sisters and your backs are facing each other. You should come and when you sit together, you should face each other. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He describes the sitting of the people in Jannah, as we just mentioned, how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe it? Ala sururin mutaqabirin. They are facing each other. So it's from the sunnah that when you come and you sit and you meet your brothers and sisters, that you face each other. Right? You don't turn your backs towards each other. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He also said, Wala ba'adukum ala ba'ad. Now, what does this mean? The easiest way to translate it is to give you an example. It's very, it's similar to what we mentioned in terms of a najish, but it's different. Why? Because this time a person he is selling something, right? So, for example, let's say I'm selling an iPhone for a thousand pound. Person walks in, sold it to him for a thousand pound, right? We agree upon it. Money has not been, yeah, and he hasn't given me the money just yet. The guy next door who has a phone shop right next door walks in and says, I'll sell it to you for £900. So the guy walks out, he goes into his shop, he buys the iPhone for £900. This is haram. This is haram, it's not allowed. After you have come to an agreement 
with your fellow Muslim brother, your fellow Muslim sister. No Muslim, no person can come now and try and rule out that contract and try and sell the same thing, less money, or even something that's better than it, uh, for less money, shall we say. It's harm. It's not permissible. Now, this differs from bidding. Bidding is completely different. Bidding is when you both have the same level of footing. Both of you are there. You say, I buy 100 pounds, 110, 150, 130. That's completely different. We're talking about a situation where we have agreed. Someone else now is coming in and he's trying to steal my customer away by selling it for less money. The Prophet is telling us to not do this. Why? Because this can be a reason for animosity and hatred to be spread between your, brother, your brothers and sisters. The Prophet is telling things, he's telling us to stay away from these things that can either be a direct reason or an indirect reason. For that which will cause harm to your brother or cause some type of hatred and animosity to enter your heart towards your brother and your sister. Okay. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, And be slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are brothers. Look at this. How do you treat your brother? You treat him with love, with compassion, with mercy. Your blood brother, how do you treat them? Treat them with love and compassion and mercy and you want khair for them. That is the same way you should treat your fellow Muslim brother in, 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 faith, uh, in faith. Your Muslim brother, you should treat him the same way. Your Muslim sister, you should treat them the same way. Let's say, for example, you're working in a place. A Muslim walks in. Generally, you would treat people in a good way. As soon as the Muslim comes in, you give them five-star service. Why? Because he is a Muslim. Some people may say, Ali, this is discrimination. Why are you treating people better than others? Us as Muslims, the believer, he is raised amongst all of the other creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The believer, he has a special place in our hearts. Why? Because he believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in tawheed. He negates shirk and he stays away from it. He is from those that are on the path towards that which will be the greatest of all success, which is Jannah bi ta'ala. We ask Allah to make us from the people of Jannah. So you treat your fellow Muslim brothers and your fellow Muslim sisters in the best way possible. Whether it be in terms of transacting, whether it be with your neighbors, whether it be the Muslims that you see in the streets. I'll give you another example. Let's say you're on the road, right? And someone is tailgating you. Or they're driving a little bit mad. And you find out that they're your Muslim brother or your Muslim sister. Treat them in a tayyib, in a good way. Give them advice. Pull over or pull the window down. Speak to them, in the, to them in a good way. Why? Because things like this, they happen. They happen a lot of the time. As soon as you see that he's your Muslim brother, generally you should treat people in a good way. Why a Muslim is? He is a person of khul, he is khuluq al-hasan. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us, wa khalaq al-nasa bi khuluq al-hasan. Treat the people in a good manner. But as soon as you see he's your brother, he is your sister from Islam, you speak to them in a good way. You tell them, fear Allah, this is not a good way, this, you can cause harm. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa forbid us from harming the people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid us from harming the people. You treat your, your brothers and sisters in a good manner, even in a situation when you are in a situation of anger. And you feel like you need to express that anger. You compress it and you, you direct you, and you deal with the people. How the Prophet sallallahu told us. وَخَالِقِ النَّاسَ بِخُلُقٍ حَسَنٍ Then the Prophet sallallahu he said لَا يَغْنِمُهُ وَلَا يَخْذُلُهُ وَلَا يَحْقِرُهُ He does not oppress his Muslim brother and sister. He does not steal from them. He doesn't do credit card fraud. He doesn't steal from their shop. He doesn't steal from their car. He doesn't oppress them verbally and, and label it as banter. Nor does he oppress them physically. What did the Prophet ﷺ say about fighting your Muslim brother? قتال المسلم فسوق وسباب المسلم فسوق وقتاله كفر. Cursing your brother or cursing the Muslim is considered to be an act of disobedience. وقتاله and fighting him is minor kufr. But yet you see the brothers in the streets. They fight over postcodes. 
They stab each other and they kill each other over postcodes. Worthless stuff. They don't even own, they, they don't even own the house they live in. But yet they're fighting over that small area. On the day of judgment, they will be held to account. And one thing you need to understand is, when you're committing a sin, there's two types of sins you can commit. You can commit a sin, and it, tra- it transgresses against the, the hudud that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. And then you can commit a sin that not only goes against the hudud, the, 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 the boundary Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set, but you are taking one of the rights of your fellow Muslim brother and sister and generally those type of sins are worse. Why? Because to seek forgiveness, you have to seek forgiveness from Allah and you have to seek, seek forgiveness from that person as well. So be wary of this. Always, always hold yourself to account. And always know that whatever you do in this life, it will always come back to you. Whether it's khair or whether it's shah. And we will talk about the aspect of of it being khayr bi Allah ta'ala in the hadith that comes after this. Wala yakhdhulu and he does not disgrace him. He see his he sees his Muslim brother or sister, they are in need of help. He does not let them down in that instance. He sees that lies are being spread about this person. He comes out to speak the truth. He knows that his fellow Muslim brother or sister needs a witness to bear witness to the fact that this thing that's being spread about them or uh, they're being accused of is completely false. He comes and he stands in that position and he aids his Muslim brother or his Muslim sister. Nor does he belittle. Do not belittle your Muslim brothers or sisters. And many of us who come to the masajid, who try to pray on time, who try to fast in the month of Ramadan, try to stay away from the Muharramat, for some of us, this might happen when we see our Muslim brothers and sisters doing, muharram, doing things that are muharram. Doing things that are haram. You see them drunk Friday nights on the street. You see them selling things that are haram on the, on the street. You see them with women or with yani in things that are considered to be haram. Some people, how do they feel? They belittle this person. They feel like they're above this person. Why? Because they are not involved in that. They may have not been trialed with those things that that person is being trialed with. As a Muslim, you should say, Alhamdulillah. Number one, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided me to Islam. Number two, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided me and kept me firm upon his obedience. Why? Because if it was not for the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none of us would be sitting here. Our gathering today comes from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants khair for us. Why? Because we have come to benefit and to understand and learn our religion. Look Look how Allah subhanahu look at how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa shows the great reward of those who come together, recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, study it, understand it, learn it. The angels they come down, the sakina comes down, the, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down and engulfs us. This is all from the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we see our brothers and sisters falling into haram, we should say Alhamdulillah. Number two, be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by showing it in our actions. And number three, make dua for our brothers and sisters. And number four, if we're able to somehow help them and take them away from this haram, this is something we should do. The Prophet ﷺ said, Unsur akhaka waliman or madruma. Help and aid your brother if he is the one who is being oppressed or the one who oppresses others. The Sahaba, they understood if the person is oppressed, how to aid that person. But if the person is, all, is the one who is doing the oppression, how do they aid? How can a person aid that person? The Prophet ﷺ explained, you take that person away from the oppression that they are doing. The haram they fall into, they are oppressing their souls. They are oppressing themselves. They are putting themselves in a situation where they could possibly be in the hellfire for a certain amount of time. Or even possibly be in the hellfire forever. Why? Because al-kufr, al-ma'asi, 
are considered to be buried with kufr since they lead to disbelief. A black person becomes numb when they hear the, the, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does not affect them. They hear the speech and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It has no effect upon them. They don't pray the salah. They couldn't care less about Ramadan. They don't, they don't even know when to pay zakat. They, have, they couldn't care less sometimes about the deen. Which unfortunately can lead to a person lead, leaving the religion of Islam. So we do not belittle our brothers and sisters. We do not belittle them. And belittling someone, what does it stem from? Who can tell me what? When you belittle someone, what, what type of feeling or what does it stem from in the heart? Takabur. Uh, arrogance. Who is known to have... Who is known to have been the first person or the first, one of the first creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Iblis. To have done this. Iblis. Kufr al istikbar. He disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the action of arrogance. This is a sin of insimat al shayateen. It's an attribute and a characteristic of the devils. Something you should completely avoid. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, Attaqwa muna. Yani. Piety is here, within the heart. And he pointed to it three times. Enough of enough of evil is that you belittle uh, your fellow brother and sister. Even without speaking. Why? Because belittling a lot of the time, it happens within the heart. It's a feeling that you feel. Takabur, it comes, it stems from the heart. Prophet is telling us that this is a, a wretched and evil thing. Every single your believer, your believing brother and sister, there are things that are considered to be completely haram. Damuhu, wa maluhu, wa His blood, if you spill his blood, if you did it on purpose, intentionally, you are liable to be killed. If you cut off his arm, if it was an accident, you are still liable to a certain extent. If you cut off his hand, you have to pay 50 camels. If you cut off one of his fingers, you have to pay 10 camels worth of. If you cut off his whole hand, 50. If you cut off both, it's considered to be 100. Whether you made the mistake or not, whether you, يعني, whether you did it intentionally or not. This, look at the, look, look at the, uh, يعني, the, 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 the sanctity of the blood of the Muslim. In situations where, whether you have the intention, where you did it on purpose or not. Look at the, the, يعني, the, 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 the how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that the blood of your brother and sister is considered to be, um, يعني, it's not easy. People that carry knives, they stab whoever they want. And think they won't, they won't answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Damuhu, wa maluhu, his wealth or her wealth, wa and their honor. You accuse them of things. You spread you spread rumors about them, and you 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 and you, you cover it as banter. You call them names, and you you give them bad nicknames, and then it spreads. All of these things are false. You are dishonoring your Muslim brother and sister. This is haram. Something you should avoid. Then, one of the other things that we can mention that your fellow Muslim brother and fellow Muslim sister have a right over you is when they come to you and they are seeking your aid, they are seeking your help, you help them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Allahu fi awn al-abd ma kana al-abd fi awn akhi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is in the aid of his servant, as long as his servant is in the aid of his fellow Muslim brother. And it also applies to his fellow Muslim sister. And I'll tell you a story. Yani, every time I come across this hadith, this, this story comes to my mind. And I mentioned this before. I remember one day, we were still, we, yani, this is when I was studying in the Jamia. It was roughly a little time. And I was walking back to my room. To go to sleep because generally in Saudi after the other people they go to sleep. It's very hot at that time. So one of the Sahani brothers he comes, he's walking up the steps and he, he comes to me. 
and he says, Akhi, how are you? Yani, give him salam. He says, we're gathering money for uh, one of the Somali brothers. They have an Ill- There's some type of illness that they have and they need medicine or something similar to that. I think the, the brother just came to Saudi and he didn't get his iqama just yet, so he couldn't get access to the hospitals. So he needed some medicine. So I said, okay, no problem. Um, how much? He said, we're collecting 100 real from everyone. Look, 100 real, you have to understand, the students get 840 real a month. 100 real is quite a big chunk of money. So when he said that, I thought to myself, um, and I remembered that that month, money was a little bit low. Money was a little bit low during that month. And I had to get my oil changed on the car. The car out there is a lifeline. Without a car, you can't really move around much. So, and it was as if time stood still for a couple of minutes. And I was thinking to myself, what should I do? I only have a little bit of money left. I have so many things I need to get done. And I thought to myself, inshallah khair. Yani money will come some way or another. Let me just give it to the brother and help him out, inshallah. And I just, I just, I remember I just pulled out that hundred riyal, thinking that I'm going to spend it maybe later on today or tomorrow or the day after. So I gave him the money. The day after, a couple of days, I don't remember exactly, um, after one of the durus, I went to go and change the oil of my car, right? And as I'm waiting, I'm pulling my books out in the back, they're cleaning the car. Me and one of the brothers were talking in English. And there's a young Saudi brother that is, is he's right next to us. And he's just listening. So after the conversation ended, he came, he came to me and he said, MashaAllah, where are you from? What are you doing here? Um, I said, I'm from the UK. I'm studying Kulit Sharia, Faculty of Sharia. He said, oh, MashaAllah, that's really good. Young brother, he was around 16, 17. Then he disappeared. So I just went back to what I was doing. And then he, a few minutes later, he came back and he gave me something in my hand. And he shook my hand and he gave it to me. And I looked and it was money. And I counted it and it was roughly close to 250 riyal. And enough for me to change my oil and have a good amount of money back. And when I think about that situation, I put it back to giving the money for that brother. To help him out with that, with his medicine. And every time I come across this hadith, I always remember that situation. Always remember, the money that you have, the risk that you will get, is maktub, is written. You have to go out and seek it. For you to increase the barakah and the, yani the blessings in your wealth, give. Give and you will receive. This is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَا نَقَصَتْ صَدَقَةٌ مِّنْ مَالٍ As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us. Sadaqa, it does not decrease your wealth. It doesn't decrease, it actually increases you in wealth and more puts more baraka in your wealth. For the meaning of zakat is a numuwa ziyada. It's an increase uh, and, and growth. This is what zakat does to your wealth. It grows it, it purifies it, it increases it in khair. So don't ever, ever think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will let you down after you have given for his sake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless you and multiply it for you in this life and the hereafter. And the issue of sadaqah, يعني, it's a completely separate topic. But remember, if you're a Muslim brother, your Muslim sister, they come to you, they're seeking help, whether it be related to the deen and they want to learn something and you have that knowledge to teach them, or whether it be related to the dunya, something that relates to their house, their bills, their car, or this happens a lot with the Muslim community. Your neighbor, maybe their English is not that good. And some letters have come to them. They don't really understand the letters. Maybe it's something to do with council tax. Maybe it's something to do with their citizenship or something to do with HMRC or something like that. Or bills, they don't really get some of these things. From their right upon you is that you aid them and you help them to the best of your ability. You understand English well, you know the system, you give them a time, I'm going to come to you tomorrow inshallah. Sit down with them, you read over the papers, even if you can p- pick up the phone, speak to them on the, uh, yani speak to the, the, the company on behalf of them, translate, how about your Muslim brothers and sisters? Sometimes, they might not even directly mention it, 
But you can see from their face that they're going through a tough time. Ask what's going on, how are you, how's things? They might be on the verge of losing their house and they don't know how to fix it because their English is not that good. But you know English, help your Muslim brothers and sisters. This is a practical example of how you can help your fellow Muslim brothers and sisters. طيب. How long do we have left? 10 minutes? Yeah? Okay. خلص. Um, the last hadith I mentioned. And this hadith, it mentions uh, the word haq. It mentions the word right. The right your Muslim brother and Muslim sister has over you. There's more than these six rights that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, but you will see these are considered to be from the major rights. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, حَقُّ الْمُسْلِمِ عَلَى الْمُسْلِمِ سِتْ That the right a Muslim has over another Muslim is six. So the Prophet, they asked the Prophet ﷺ, what are these six rights that they have over you? The Prophet ﷺ, he said, إِذَا لَقِيتَهُ إِذَا لَقِيتَهُ فَسَلِّمْ عَلَيْهِ If you see him, or if you see her, give them salam. Nowadays, what do people do? They only give salam to the people they know. Prophet is telling us the right of a Muslim over a Muslim. He didn't specify it. He didn't say your Muslim brother that you know, your Muslim neighbor, your Muslim blood brother or blood sister. The Prophet said Muslim encompasses everyone. You give salam to your Muslim brothers and sisters. Not just those that you know. The Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned, The Prophet ﷺ, he said, You will never ever ever enter Jannah until you believe. And you will never believe until you love each other. Shall I show you something that if you were to do it, it would increase the love amongst you? Afshu salam abaynakum. Spread the salam amongst you. And you will see this, wallah. You will see a random Muslim brother. Maybe you see him every day on your, on your way to work. You give him salam. Every day you, give him, you start to give him salam. You will see your relationship and your love for that brother, it will increase. Your relationship will be completely different. Some of us, there's people we give salam to, we don't even know their names. We don't know where they live, but we see them around the area, we give them salam. We have a better relationship with them. Even though it's not even to the extent where we sometimes have a full-on conversation. We just give them salam, but there is that brotherhood. That's, there's that feeling of brotherhood. So the Prophet was telling us, number one, we give them salam. Number two, that if he calls you, invites you, so for example, if he invites you to a walima, then you answer that call, answer that invitation. As long as it's not a walima, that is يعني, where there's things that are haram going on over there. And if you were to go there, you would not be able to remove that haram. Those type of invitations we don't go to. We don't accept those invitations. We stay away from the places of haram. Or if it's a place where the people of innovation are going to be spreading their bid'ah and khurafat and all of these different things. We don't go to those type of places. We stick to the Qur'an and the Sunnah and we stick to the places where the Sunnah is being spread. So we, we accept our, the invitation of our Muslim brother and our Muslim sister. Number three, And if he seeks advice from you and he seeks your counsel, then give him advice. And you would see this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes the sahaba, they would come to the Prophet ﷺ. They would say, oh, see me, give me advice. And he would advise them. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would give them advice without them even asking. And this was from the hikmah, this was from the tarbiyah of the Prophet ﷺ, how he would nurture his companions upon tawheed and sunnah. So if they come to you seeking advice, another thing you have to understand about when a person comes to you seeking advice is that they see you as a person and they hold you in high regard.
they wouldn't come to you and seek some type of solution from you unless they respected you and they held you in high regard. So do not belittle your Muslim brother and sister by turning them away. If they come to you, they need your advice on a specific situation, something they're going through, and you know you're a person that has expertise in this specific thing, help your Muslim brother, help your Muslim sister, you would be acting upon this hadith, and you will be fulfilling their rights. If the person, if he sneezes, and he says, Alhamdulillah, فَشَمِّتُهُ what, what do we say? When a person says, Alhamdulillah, what do we say? We say, Yarhamakallah. This is from his right. When the person says what? Yarhamakallah. Yarhamakallah. Excellent. The, last, uh, the fifth one is that, وَإِذَا مَرِضَ فُعُدْهُ And if a person, he becomes ill, then visit that person. Number one, this is from the rights that they have over you. Number two, they will, sometimes you will go and you will visit that person and you will see that their situation will get better. It's not the medicine that's helping them. It's that you know, I mean, emotional support. Sometimes that, that happiness that enters their heart because their Muslim brother has come and visited them, brought some, you know, maybe some small gifts. Person was, you know, sometimes a person here will be happy with the fact that you are thinking about them. So if you hear of your fellow Muslim brother or your fellow Muslim sister is ill in hospital, go and visit them. If they're ill in the house, go and visit them. This is from the rights they have over you. This is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And if he dies or she dies, follow their janazah. This is a right they have over you. Every single Muslim, when they die, on the whole ummah, they have a right for them to be washed, Prayed over, washed, shroud in a shroud, prayed over and buried. These four things, every single Muslim who dies has the right upon the whole ummah. There's a, there has to be at least one or two or three people who do this. Otherwise, the whole ummah is considered to be sinful. So we wash the body. We put it in a shroud. We pray over it and we make dua for the person. And we, grave, we put them in the grave and we yani, uh, bury them in a noble manner. This is the right a Muslim has over you. You see these six rights the Prophet ﷺ mentioned? These are from the greatest rights your fellow Muslim brother, your fellow Muslim sister they have over you. Yani, the issue of rights, we can go on for a very, very long time. But we'll keep it at that for today. Subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, shaydu an la ilaha 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 إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءل النبي والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد the Almighty to make this I ask Allah Azza wa Jal the Almighty to make this gathering a beneficial one as our beloved brother mentioned the hadith the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says authentic hadith la yaqa'udu qawmun yathkurun Allah aw mashtama qawmun fi bayti min buyuti Allah يسوي كتاب الله ويتبع رسوله فيما بينهم أو بينهم في الرواية إلا نزلت عليهم السكينة وغشتهم الرحمة وحفتهم الملائكة ونقرهم الله في من عنده إن لسه فنت الحديث في الله صلى الله عليه وسلم he informed us and he gave us glad tidings by saying to us that people don't gather come together a group of people don't get together in a place from the houses of Allah 
many ways are different, narrations are different. Even if you're not in the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, as some authentic narrations came, seeking knowledge like the likes of these, except one listen to this hadith, except that Allah Azza wa Jal sends down the angels to surround them. So just now where we are today, ask Allah Azza wa to accept it from us and to make it sincere. Do you know how great that is of a blessing? That you're in a place where Allah is the way, just like the Lord mentioned, where the angels are surrounding you, and this cannot only happen except that is from the tawfiq of Allah is the Meaning, Allah enabled each and every one of us to come from our houses, our household, and many of us came from far to gather together and to sit in the house of Allah, the most beloved places to Allah the Almighty Jalla Jalla. Except what? Allah sent down angels. Surround even if one came to the places like this, a mischief, and didn't intend to sit in a lesson of gathering, but just came, maybe just to, maybe for the Raka'at table, praise Allah, and he sat, he also gets the reward. Allahumma ja'alna minhum ya rabbu, taqabbal minna. And also, the hadith goes into mention, and tranquility descends upon them, and they're remembered by Allah Azza wa Jal, and Allah makes a mention, a mention of them, with their Rawal Muslim Abu Dawood, may Allah Azza wa Jal accept it from us. Now, the topic of today is the rights, or a right that your soul has over you. My brothers and sisters, we live in a day and age today in the West where sometimes we forget ourselves. Many of us are practicing the deen of Islam, alhamdulillah, it's a great blessing. But sometimes we are extreme in certain matters. And when one is extreme in certain matters or certain affairs from the deen and he forgets himself and he is not moderate with this deen because this deen is the deen of Wasatiya then it becomes a case where he will end up reaching that point, that edge where he just drops. So that's why the deen of Islam came to clarify things for us. And, for and I want each and every one of you to pay attention. Okay, pay attention to the hadith and be in the way we're going to take benefits from the hadith. وَعَنْ عَمِي عَلِي بِالْحَيْفَ عَنْ عَمِيهِ قَالْ آخَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ So upon the narration of that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he made kinship, that love, the brotherhood between بَيْنَ سَلَّمُ وَلِدَّرْدَى the Prophet and this was known just like when he came to Medina, it was one of the first things he did. That he made them be from brothers, be from one. He made them unite, he united them. And this is what he did with Salman and Abi Darda. Now a benefit we can take just from that is that the Prophet وسلم, he wanted Islam to spread. He wanted the brothers to be close. He wanted the companions. Because if the Prophet وسلم, did not do that, when he came to Medina, and this is when, of course, it's the second stage of Islam being carried out and established and something new starting in Medina. If the Prophet وسلم, did not make them close together, the Muhammad and Ansar, how would he have been able to go and stand in front of the enemies and fight if they are, dis if they are, if they are not united? The Muhammad and Ansar. It would have been more or less impossible. So this is one of the benefits that we take from this, that he made Salman and Darda unite. So one day, Fazawa Salman Abu Darda. So Salman came to visit his companion Abu Darda. And he saw Farah Abu Darda, Mutabaddir, his wife, Abu Darda, in a shabby state. You know, she wasn't the state that a wife should be to her husband. So he was confused, he was confused and he said, فَقَالَ لَهَا مَا شَأْنُكِ What's the reason? What's, what's the reason why you're in this specific state? So she said and she replied, "Qalat akhuka Abu Darda laysa lahu hajatun fi dunya Very your brother has no intent or any sort of love for this worldly life. Then afterwards, shortly afterwards, he came, and he made food for his companion, Salman. And he said to him, Abu Dhabi said to Salman, فَقَالَ لَهُ كُلْ And Salman said that he was going to eat, of course. فَقَالَ بِهِمْ يِصَالِمْ Abu Dhabi, when he was told he was going to eat with Salman, he said that verily I am fasting. And then when this happened, قَالَ مَا أَنَا بِآكِلِمْ حَتَّى تَأْكُلْ Salman responded to him and said, 
It's impossible for me to do such a thing. I'm going to eat in your house in your presence and you're going to be fasting. I won't do so, meaning I won't eat until you eat. And then eventually night came in. Falamma kana al-layl, the hadith was to mention Falamma kana al-layl, la hada Abu Darda yaqul. When night came in, Abu Darda went to try and start to pray the night prayer. So Salma responded to him and he said, Now sleep. And then afterwards he slept. Then to get up to pray for the night. Now this is the most important. This is Mahal Shari. When the Lord came in, Salman he came to Abu Darda and he said to him, Inna li Rabbika alayka haqqan, wa li nafsika alayka haqqan, wa li ahlika alayka haqqan, fa'a'ti kulla di haqqi haqqan. This hadith is such a profound hadith and it's one that we should all benefit from. He said to him, that very your Lord has worked over you. That's the most important thing. He started with his Lord. Because as Allah mentions in the Quran, Allah khalaq to jinn wal insa illa. Verily, I did not create mankind in jinn except that they worship me alone. So he started with that. And then he said to him, that also your soul has rights over you. Okay, your body has rights over you. And he said also, your family, meaning your wife and your children, also have rights over you. So you should give each and every single one, meaning your Lord, Allah Jalla Jalal, yourself and your wife and children, their due rights that they have over you. And he wanted to do this in order to teach some man, in order to teach Ali Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. And then afterwards, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came and he was informed about what happened between them two. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Sadaqa Salman, Rawah Bukhari. He said, Verily, Salman has spoken the truth. Now, this hadith, brothers and sisters, is a hadith that we should all learn from and we should take from it and know that what does it mean? And the bit that I'm going to try and even learn concentrate on is the one of Yunafsika alayhi haq, meaning that your soul has rights over you. Because it's very important. It's very, very important, and many Muslims today unfortunately don't understand this. This hadith is a proof that we as Muslims, we should of course not be lenient to the extent where we disobey Allah Jalla Jalla Jalla. No. And we shouldn't be extreme to the extent where we completely disregard our livelihood. Rather, we should be in the middle and wasatiyya. We should be moderate. As Muslims, we should be moderate. Now, that having said that, it means that when you are practicing the deen, especially I remember my days when I was younger, I was very I don't understand it's not something where it is bad, it's not a bad extreme, because many brothers today, young youngsters are conceived this masjid at the age of 18, 15, 14, whenever Allah guides one, you have this hamas and you have this, you know, it's like you've been given this jewel cell battery, it's just been put inside you. Okay, and you have this battery that has been put inside you and all you want to do is just worship Allah Azza and obey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and completely forget about things. But then because of this, because of ignorance and because maybe bad companionship, you become extreme in affairs where maybe you can be the cause of making your own family members be put off the deen. So that which you're practicing is khayr, is good. However, at the same time, the issue is that you were extreme in those affairs. So maybe you chased away your loved ones that you wanted to what? Try to guide to Islam. That's why it's crucial for us, brothers and sisters, to try when we are practicing the deen of Islam, practice it. But don't forget that the deen of Islam was not sent down to what? To burden one's soul. Allah Azza wa will not burden your soul more than it can bear. So when you're practicing this deen of Islam, remember that there is moderation, just like how the Prophet was. And there's an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim where the companions they went to the Prophet and they said to him, Our oh, Messenger of Allah, we find ourselves when we're around you in a state of high iman. Our iman is literally the highest that it can be. And when we leave you, when we go back to our family members, meaning we live our life, our livelihood, we see ourselves that our iman 
goes down. It's not the same level that it was when we were around your Messenger of Allah. So they went to the Messenger of Allah in order to seek advice and find a solution for this problem. What did the Prophet Sallallahu say to say to them? He said that verily if you were like this, meaning the state of Haniman around me all the time, then the angels would have shaken your hands. Meaning it's impossible. That's not the reason why you're supposed to be steadfast, brothers and sisters. It's not that 24-7 you're supposed to you know, be harsh upon yourself. Now, having said that, in this hadith it says, give your It's due right, meaning Allah has the wajah, you worship Him and you obey Him, you stay within the boundaries of Islam. Also, yourself, you give yourself that right that your soul has. For example, many people when they do start practicing, they fast the song of Dawood alayhi salam. Okay, one day on, one day off. Because they hear about the hadith, one day on, one day off. They start playing Qiyamul Layl every single day. Maybe they could have school, maybe they have uni, maybe they have work. Okay, and even to the extent where every single day they fast and then the next day they leave off. So for those that have family members, it's going to be difficult upon your family members. For, from them, it could be your parents or it could be your wives and your children. We're not saying this fasting is not something that we're, we're, we're not, I'm not discouraging it. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I mean be moderate. Because when you start this, especially if you just started practicing something and you have very little knowledge, it's not going to last long. And as that which is known in the authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, that the most beloved actions to Allah Azza wa the most beloved action that you can do, brothers and sisters, is what? Something even if it is small but continuous. Because you want to live this life of practicing the deen of Islam until you enter your grave. So that it will testify for you everything that you did. Now, if you do this with just from the beginning, enter the deen and you start practicing and you're doing so many things, you may reach a stage where it gets too much for you. And that's why the Prophet وسلم, he used to always teach his companions to be moderate. A simple example is when the Arabi, the man came and he started urinating a Allah in the part of the masjid. And the companions, they wanted to literally go to him and to take him out because of that which he was doing. And the Messenger of Allah Wasallam, what did he say to them? He said to them, leave him for verily. If you do, do what that which you want, then it's going to be more harm. So he's teaching them to be, to use wisdom in that specific situation. But at the same time, you have to know how to do something when his due time comes. And just the same with regard to practicing the deen of Islam. It doesn't mean because you read the hadith, you're going to implement it straight away, every single time, even if you know it's heavy upon you. Remember one thing, the ulama they mentioned, a sidq ma'ala azzawajal, well sidq ma'ala sidq is the most, one of the most crucial things, after sincerity of course, that helps someone carry on practicing the deen of Islam. If you are sincere to Allah the Almighty, and yourself, okay, so you are sincere, in that which you're doing, and you're doing it for the sake of Allah. Then you're truthful to Allah, you're doing it for the right reasons. You're not lying to yourself. Afterwards, if you try and be truthful to yourself, you know yourself that you're not someone that can fast all of these days, but yet you're going to push yourself and overburden yourself. Not just that, but you're going to stay in the masjid from morning all the way to evening. Many people, they do this, they just stay in the masjid. And not just that, brothers, but something that is probably up until now still the trend. Brothers, they start practicing, the gospel of dunya. This is not what the deen teaches us, brothers and sisters. As soon as they start uh, accomplish things within their lives, had credentials, had some sort of education, but then as soon as they started practicing the deen, they were, they were too much and they overloaded themselves with things, thinking everything is haram. And then what happens? 10 years down the line, 15 maybe, you see some of them unfortunately they leave off the deen. Because they saw and then they start blaming Allah or blaming the deen. This is not the state of a Muslim, how it should be. If you were in the beginning, from the get-go, moderate. Yes, fear Allah Azza wa Jal. Ittaqullah haythama kuntum. Fear Allah Azza wa Jal, wherever you are. But at the same time, you have to know that the deen of Islam is a deen of ease. It's not sent down and it wasn't revealed to the Messenger of Allah and he didn't call the people in order to make their livelihood harder than it really is. Especially, especially in the day and age we live in today, brothers and sisters. 
We live in a day and age today where everything is seen as normal. So therefore you have to make sure you fit Allah Azza wa from that journey. But at the same time, you what? You remember to be moderate. You remember to be moderate. Now, we have issues in our community. Unfortunately, that happens to many of us. Now this topic is going to be a topic that maybe could be a bit touchy for some. So, just to warn beforehand, but the evening that I hope at the end of it, we can try and take benefit so that it stops because many people are suffering. And from those things that, that are occurring in our day-to-day -day lives, from them is stress, depression, anxiety, okay? And it can lead to certain things, mental, mental, uh, mental health and mental illness. Many people are suffering, unfortunately. This is the sad reality. But we have to try and find out what is the cure, what is the solution. Okay? What is the solution for this problem? Because many people is driven through their own actions, then being too harsh upon themselves. The main brothers and sisters, the main cure is curing the heart. Curing the heart and strengthening the heart. Because everything comes from the heart. Okay? Cure means that when you strengthen the heart, due to the heart needing all necessary to keep it strong so that it can be able to handle certain things, if one makes it sound, then inshallah the rest of their body, as we know the authentic hadith, that if the heart is sound, then inshallah the rest of the body will be sound. Allah Azza wa mentions in the Quran, Alayhi Sallallahu Bi Kafin Abdas. Isn't Allah sufficient for His servants? And He mentions in the Quran, Ma Kafir Allah, Huwa Mulana. It's the end of the ayah. Barakallahu Fiq. Wa Ala Allahi Fil Yatawa. This is a verse that we should literally see. That if anything was to uh, afflict me or you, or we were faced with trials and tribulations of certain things that we're going through, and many people do suffer alone, but you have to remember that Islam is the key and Islam is the cure for anything you could be suffering. And there isn't a single thing that was sent down with regards to illnesses or diseases except that there is a cure for it. Can I call the Hadith as Sahih? As Muslim mentioned in the authentic Hadith, so remember. Don't be from those that suffers alone or suffers in silence. Because yes, you could be going through certain things, but the deen of Islam, as Allah mentioned in the Quran, it's very simple and clear that the deen, there isn't a single thing that is good or is mentioned in the Quran. And the reason us, except the Prophet informed us, therefore remember. That yes, maybe you may be going through certain things that are difficult, but you have to realize and know from the things that cure, of course, is Islam and the Quran. From them, here at Tawakkul, reliance. Now, when one has reliance upon Allah Azza wa Jal, then he knows that whatever he is going through, Allah will be the only one to cure it. That's something that you should all remember and all know. Another one is that one should be pleased with that which Allah has decreed upon them. So if you're going through something difficult, have personal bond with Allah Azza wa Jal. It's not because Allah Azza wa Jal wants to send you to destruction or wants to make things difficult. كَمَا قَالَ إِبْنِ قَيْمٍ رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَبْتَلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنِ لِكَيْ يُهْلِكَهُ وَلَكِنْ يَبْتَلِيَ الْمُؤْمِنِ لِكَيْ يَمْتَحِنْ صَبْرَهُ Ibn Qayyim mentions, and this is something profound by him, رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ that Allah Azza wa Jal does not test and trial the believers in order to what? To send them to destruction or to leave them alone, or to make things difficult, or to overburden them, but rather to test their patience. So everything happens for a reason. Now, many people are afflicted with these things. These things, of course, we should know and realize, but if you are going through depression, if you are stressed in your life, if you have anxiety, panic attacks, mental illnesses, all of these problems, it all starts with the thought. It all starts with just majority your thought, okay? Oh, man. that's all it is, nothing more. So the shaitan is working day in, day out. And if you have been afflicted with these things, then shaitan knows that that is your weakness. So he's not going to leave you alone. 
shaitan is your enemy and he will be and he has been since the day of time the beginning of time but we should know that we should treat him as an enemy because he already is we have to realize and understand that you right now go through these things if you're able to fight it okay fight these things by knowing and telling yourself reading and reading Quran and doing dhikr then you're helping yourself be able to take away these things that are just thoughts because it starts with thoughts however they could lead to things that are more severe okay they could lead to things that are more severe how many of us we know maybe our family members unfortunately and sadly may Allah Azza wa Allah Muslim Allah and Allah Muslimin many of our family members maybe people that are close to us and loved ones are in mental hospitals now brothers and sisters ask yourself really and truly sincerely a person may go to that place in a bad state they could enter that place in a bad state maybe they had certain things but I know people myself personally by Allah they go much worse than when they came in okay these institutes and these places were set up unfortunately to make someone better because Allah even if you have the most severe it matter if it's mental or not mental, or not mental the pill is not what is curing you and it will not cure you but rather it's Allah Azza wa us Muslims unfortunately specifically in the West we have this problem that we believe that our GP or our doctor is the one that is giving us the cure and this is a khala, this is a big problem because Allah Azza wa actually causes maybe that medication to be a means okay a means of you getting better okay so we sh if we know these things and we see it day in day out then let's try and resolve the problems that are many people are suffering today unfortunately the sheikh mentions sheikh abdul zaq al badr hafizullah he mentions a great benefit he mentions and states that when one leaves the house he starts off with saying what do you say when you leave the house what do you say when you leave your house huh bismillah tawakkalna Allah. Exactly that what the young brother said is that which, it, which each and every Muslim should say. Now he actually get being the means, and he said to them, he said that when one says this, Bismillah, when they leave their house, first of all, they're leaving their house by, by saying Bismillah with the name of Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay. When you say Tawakkal, what does it mean? It means literally every single thing. From your worldly life, you're leaving it to Allah. Allah you're leaving it to Allah. You know that Allah Azza wa Jal will not let you down. And this is, of course, without about the truth. When Sheikh mentions here, he says that you are submitting and you're testifying, okay, wholeheartedly that without, without Allah Azza wa Jal, you're weak and hopeless. And that's the state of Bani Adam, okay? We have been created weak. and utters these things. It is said to him, Okay? Or Waqita. Hulita. Wakufita or Waqita. Three things. And also Taya. These three these three things, which is that you are being guided by you saying these things when you leave your house, so don't forget yourself that when you leave your house you say these things. As Muslims we have shuru, we have conditions, we have you know Everything is background. Your Hajj Islam is the solution for every problem that you have. Now, here it's mentioned that it is said to him these things, meaning that he is guided by Ibn Allah Ta'ala. And he also, when he leaves his house, when he's saying to a to Allah, it means that accomplish that day the evening that Allah is and the last thing that he is protected from all evils and all harms so before you even leave your house you should say these things now from the thing are people overwhelming about things okay and giving in to the shaitan when you have a issue Let's say you have been trapped for the fathers or the mothers, maybe your son or your daughter 
is not practicing, is not respecting. happens for a reason so why are you worrying stop worrying if that's the case stop worrying and know that if you turn back to Allah so make duas if you have an issue if your kid your children are not maybe you know giving you the respect you deserve your wife or your husband or your parents or your loved ones or whatever it could be in life return back to Allah Allah this is what you should do. If you want to ask anyone, ask your Lord Jalla Jalali. Don't go, don't go to your doctor. Don't go to a, a specialist or a therapist. No, ask Allah Azza wa Jal. Make dua to Allah and we're going to cover the means that you can do as well. But the first thing should be that you return back to Allah Azza wa Jal. Because you have that thiqa billah. Okay, you trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. And you have tawakkul. You rely upon Allah. Another thing as well, unfortunately, many of us, we get angry quickly, okay? We have a temper, a short temper. Many people have short tempers. Now, what did the Prophet ﷺ, the best of mankind, advise the companion that came to him when he said to him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, advise me. Ah, Allah. He said to him, do not get angry. How many times? Three times. He could have said it once, but to show how important it is, to emphasize that it is very important for one to not, to not get angry. Now, we should know as well the other hadith, authentic hadith, that get, being someone strong is not someone that you're able to work, you're able to defeat someone in a battle or a fight or what have you, but rather when you're in that state of anger, when it's about to happen, you're able to cool yourself and calm yourself down. Anger leads to depression, brothers and sisters. Okay, When you get angry too quickly, it can also lead to high blood pressure. It can lead to other things that make you literally want, you could even explode or want to do certain things when you're younger, Billah, suicide. Okay, because of the fact it stemmed off from something small, which is just something you can maintain and control, which is anger. Our deen of Islam is a perfect, beautiful religion. You shouldn't let things get to you up here. If you know that you have anger issues, if something is going wrong, let's say you have an argument between your children or even your wife, or maybe your parents, or your other billah, or anyone, your, your friends. If you know yourself that you're going to, you have a temper, you generally know that you have a temper, and you're trying to battle it and defeat it, but it's difficult. Step out of that room. Get out of that room. Don't stay in that toxic place. If you know you're in an environment where you have friends where you generally, day in, day out, you fall, you have an argument, step out of that toxic relationship between you and your friends because it's not healthy for you. It's going to lead you to doing certain things that you would not want to do and regret. So therefore, if you do that and you know yourself, you have to know yourself and be truthful to yourself. If you know that you're a person that gets angry quickly, then make sure that anything that, that does anger you or could anger you, you leave it to a sign. Be, the, be someone that you, you're trying to stop all of these things. And many people, unfortunately, they don't realize or they don't know that they have certain things because of the fact that they've never actually visited the doctors. Or they have issues caused and when they go there they get given pills. Now these pills, are they curing you or making you worse? Okay? These are the things you should ask yourself. Because, alhamdulillah, we're not saying that don't take medication. No, I would be like, if you need something, of course, and it's a means, but don't think it's going to help you if you have forgotten Allah Azza wa Jalla. This is where the issue is. Okay? This is where the issue is. We should know that a thing that does help, 
especially for the sisters specifically. A lot of them go through things in silence, unfortunately. Our daughters, our sisters, our mothers, our aunties, they go through certain things. Now, us as brothers, okay, how is the Prophet وسلم, And this is to tomorrow's topic, inshallah, with the last two, the rights upon the spouse. Brothers and sisters, the Prophet وسلم, he reached an old age in his life, sallallahu alayhi wa And he was able to treat his wives, not one, wives, in such a beautiful manner that we should look at him as an example. He's our role model. One of the authentic hadith mentions that when he reached a certain age, past 50 years old, he raised Aisha radiallahu anha. He's having fun with his wife. He's taking care of places. And some of the narration mentions when you can find Abu Ibn Makhtum that it was even a battlefield that they were going, but he would take his wives, and one and that specific time was Aisha radiallahu anha. So he told his jays to them. We said to them, go ahead, go ahead of us. And he raised his wife. Now, is he doing this just for the sake that he lost? Of course, yes, but also because he knows that he's going to leave something good within her heart. She's going to feel good that my, my husband actually loves me. Now, as men, as husbands, be kind to your wife. Because just this, it could be a thing where, well, you know, we're not even talking about uh, physical abuse, it could even be just that verbal abuse that you give, maybe you put her down, you discourage her, it affects her. And she is patient and patient until she is led to having certain things that she didn't need to have from them. Depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, and the list goes on. Now, you should, as a person, as a brother, as a Muslim, the one that fears Allah Azza wa Jal, should be someone that aids your wife or your daughter or your sisters or your aunties or your mothers in order for them to have what? A good, normal state with regards to their mind. From the things... That help is going out, sightseeing, traveling, going for walks. If you know that maybe you and, and this is something also that we should remember as a know, that we should be as Muslims, we should have that sharp mind, we should have problems, we should have that sharp mind where we are able to pick up. If you have children, and you have maybe younger sisters even, or younger daughters, or younger brothers, if you have children and they go through certain things, try and be as that father, or as that brother, or whoever it could be, be someone that you are aware of what's going on. Because even children, and it's, and it's literally, you can see in the reports and the stats, that even they go through these things. But many of us, many of us, unfortunately Muslims, we don't read into these things. And this is a khala, this is a, a deficiency. This is something wrong. We should read into these things. So we understand them. So, oh qadr Allah, if our children were afflicted with these things, we're able to deal with them. Alhamdulillah, Islam is a solution, generally speaking. But we know what these things are the symptoms, what causes them, what cures them, why is my child acting like this for my brother or my younger sister or my younger brother, so therefore you're able to cure. A child may be going through certain things, panic attacks, and you don't know yourself, and you say to them, keep quiet, stop quiet, what are you scared for? These are the things that, khawani could even make it worse, you can damage them even more. Okay, from the things that help a young child is you encouraging them. Many of us parents, unfortunately, we are not from those parents the way the Prophet ﷺ was to his children and to the Ummah. Encourage your child, Wallahi Alim, just one kalim of tayyibah can make that child into something successful, some, someone great. Just say to them, MashaAllah, that's good Allah, my guy. very good, I'm proud of you, congratulations. Just something small they accomplish, if they come to you and a child does that, generally speaking, they come to you to seek that sort of you know, comfort and love and that attention. Give it to them, they need it. Because Wallahi, if you don't give them that attention they need, Male or female, whether it's your daughter or, 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 or son, they'll go seek and get elsewhere. When Iyadu Billah, and that's something that you would have to live up to. You don't want them to go seeking that attention from outside of the household because they should get inside. So, inshallah, when they grow up, there is no, there's nothing missing within their livelihood when they were a child, in that childhood. So, this is something also we should always, always bear in mind. Try and see what's going on. Why is my child acting up? Why is my younger brother or sister acting up? How can I help them? And that's why it is known that the Prophet used to always advise us, and he says in the authentic hadith that the one that does not have mercy to the young ones is not from us. Why? Because he was merciful, he taught mercy. And that's what the deen of Islam is a deen of mercy. Another thing as well that we see in our community, unfortunately, uh, brothers and sisters, is that a lot of times we know about these things. Maybe we can have some sort of insight or knowledge to these things, but we ignore them. We don't want to talk about them. Okay? And if we don't talk about these things, how are they going to be resolved? 
How are we going to be able to resolve these things if we do not talk about them? Now, Allah mentions in the Quran, وَلَا تَبْتَبِعُ خُطْوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ Okay? Don't follow the footsteps of shaitan. Why? Because he calls you to evil. Shaitan, of course, he knows. Now, listen cl closely. Shaitan, when he is giving you his words, he's whispering in your ears to think bad, to put yourself down, and all these things, he knows that what? That which he has whispered to you, if you do give in to that whisper, then it's going to be a means of what? Distracting you from the sole main purpose you were created for, which is worship Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's what many people, they have. They have this words, they have depression and stress and what have you, and they're not able to do anything where they will be just living their lives and even worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal. If they were able to not give in to those thoughts that are merely just thoughts, then what would have happened? They would have been able to make dua. They would have been able to read the Quran which is the best of remembrance that one can do. They would have been able to make dua, to be around good people, to be in the masajid, and all of these things would have helped them crush and completely annihilate that small thing that started off as literally like a seed, which is a thought. <coughs> Another thing that we should all remember and know, also, is that something like mental illness, or depression, or anxiety, Stress shouldn't be something that we belittle. Yeah. Many of us do belittle it. Maybe our wives come to us and, and you know try to inform us that I'm, you know I'm, I'm thinking about things. But yet, as men, unfortunately, we just give them a solution and tell them, don't give into it. It's not important. We're just overthinking. You know, I don't want to hear it. I heard it so many times. This shouldn't be the case, brothers and sisters. This shouldn't be the case, brothers. Why? Because of the fact that if you know that your wife is going through certain things, okay, then you should be the one to be able to help. Her resolve that issue. Okay, many of us, Wallahi, unfortunately today, we practice our deed, alhamdulillah, which is khay, and then we get married, but we don't know about certain things, and this is why it says that al jahl, literally al jahl, is, is literally an illness. Okay, and ilm is a cure. Being ignorant is a, literally a great illness, because when you don't know something, you're going to react according to that which you know, your own intellect, which is wrong. So when you do, and then for all those that are married, all those that wanted to get married, if you do have that situation where maybe your wife goes through it, specifically after uh, when the sisters give birth, when a, when a woman gives birth, it usually affects a lot, okay? A great number. Some of them don't even know what it is, okay? Some of them suffer alone. You have to realize and know, I need to check myself. Let me just stop and see and analyze. Look at your household from a bird's eye view. Always try and do that. Look at your household from a bird's eye view. Even if you're not a father, generally speaking, let's say you're someone that Allah has guided to practice the deen of Islam. Look at your household from a bird's eye view. And look at it and see to try and see, okay, where are the problems? Something's not going right. There's arguments in the household. This, and then try to look at it from that perspective so that you're able to resolve it. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Now, when sisters do go through this, we should try our utmost best to help them relieve these problems. And I mentioned them earlier, from them, the, the things that they can do physically is going to the gym maybe, okay? Taking their minds off that which they have from their day-to-day -day lives. That motherhood that is difficult upon many of them, which is not easy, hence why we have to give our mothers more respect, and you know, they come first, second and third, and the father just gets a certificate. Alhamdulillah. But of course, it's for a reason, brothers, because they go through some things that we would never have been able to go through. Okay? Now, when a woman is going through these things, you're supposed to help them from them, taking them for walks. Just that walk, change of environment, helps relieve their mind, helps take that, maybe the things that they were going through off their mind. Another thing is, like I mentioned, going to the gym, doing something, alhamdulillah, which is halal, which also helps. Because if they're able to do certain things, also doing sports and activities that they like. Who said in the deen of Islam that it's haram for women to do sports? These are the things that many of us unfortunately have been subjected to believing. And that's why, specifically the sisters, they think everything is haram when they start practicing. And they go through certain things and they're already a dunya sister and not make an to send them. Well, general to carefully. This, this dunya is a prison for the believers and paradise for the non-believers. Don't make it even worse for yourself or the last to overburden yourself, brothers and sisters. Okay? If you're able to do something halal, that which Allah Azza wa Jal has made halal, and it is halal nadeen, then do so if it's going to help you fix these problems. Because they are problems that's going to stop you. It's going to be like a jidam, like a wall 
from you and your Lord and worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, having a look at what it actually means, meaning depression, it's a feeling, okay? We mentioned it's a feeling. When you feel low, you feel low, you feel sad, hopeless, you have like a hopeless mood, maybe you're always moody, especially when you go through something difficult in life, like situations you've lost someone, you know, and when it lasts for more than two weeks, it can suggest that, generally speaking, if you were to go to your doctor, they'll say to you, okay, you have depression. Usually speaking, they will provide you with pills, which is going to make you worse, not better. Okay, now, when you have, even it could be in a state where you have positive things going around, maybe you just had a child, maybe you just had, you know, uh, you just graduated, positive things are happening, happening in your life, but yet you're still in that mood, you're still low. And this is when it is, you know that you have this specific thing, which is depression. Okay, when you have a loss of interest in terms of regards to enjoying things, the, the usual activities, your hobbies, a sense of hopelessness, um, anger, lack of energy, sleep problems, difficult concentrating, making decisions, remembering things, feeling guilty, something you don't usually do, it happens to you. You know, when you feel hopelessness, you know, when you feel like you're, you're not worthy of anything, and you put yourself so low, all of these things, and you have bad thoughts, maybe sometimes suicidal thoughts when you're able to do that, all of these are signs of what? Depression. Now, I'm just going to tell you these things, and I'm going to tell you what usually they will say, how to cure them, and inshallah we'll conclude them, what Islam has in terms of curing them. Anxiety, feelings of fear, when someone usually, you're, you're afraid of things, even if it could be things that are meaningless, okay? Um, everyday concerns, maybe you're just scared of your day-to-day -day life, what's going to happen, your performance, maybe you've got work, you're just generally scared all the time. You're going to be in a big crowd, you have that feeling that you're going to fail. Okay, when you're at school, relationships, work, some people even to the extent where they don't even want to get into a relationship with hell because they have that anxiety, they think they're going to fail everything. Signs of anxiety could mean, you know, could be when you, it's difficult for you with regards to managing that fear or that worry. And a sense of being on edge, a sense of dread, you know, feeling that you're, you're literally in a, in a panic room where you're just doomed. When you have stomach pains and what have you, all of these things, when you're unable to stop thinking about all these things when you worry, ask yourself, do I spend a lot more time worrying than I do? Not worry. Am I someone that I avoid spending time with my peers, with my friends, with my loved ones, even with my family members? Do I worry about things that I can't control? Even if it's not me that I have these things, but I just generally can't control them, but yet I still worry about them. If all of these things you answered one to one of them, okay, usually if you to go to a doctor or someone to advise you, or your local GP, and you want to tell them these things, what would they advise you? To see a therapist. And a therapist, of course, when they will see you, they will prescribe you many, many pills, and they will say to you, the solution is you have to keep coming, we're going to discuss and talk about these things. My brothers and sisters, let's just take a stop and pause. Let's say you answered yes to any of them, the number one key and cure for all of these things is the Qur'an and the Deen of Islam. The Qur'an is the cure for everything. The Qur'an is a cure for everything. It was set down as a means of cure. Literally, we know this, okay? But yet we seem to forget. We seem to think that, yes, it's true, I've got these things. I need to go to these pills. I need to take these pills. I need to see a, a, a therapist. If you were to just realize and know that the Qur'an is a cure, then maybe some would say, but I can't read the Quran, I can't speak Arabic. No, but even just pondering in whatever language you speak and reading the Quran, making dua and knowing that Islam is a cure, and from the things we mentioned, inshallah, your problems or these things will come to a stop and come to an end because Wallahi the Shaytan is happy to see each and every single one of us in that state where we're not able to worship Allah the Almighty. It could be many things as well that we go through in our lives. We see it. We think about it, we over worry, and then it makes us stop doing that thing. Just an example, uh, Riyadh. What did the ulama say that when you start an action or act of worship in a state of insincerity, what are you supposed to do if you get that feeling that you're doing it for the wrong reasons? What are you supposed to do? It's a question. Yes, that. Carry on. 
Because it's just the shaitan wanting to what? Make you stop that act of worship. Telling you, you're not doing it for the right reasons. Even though it started off for the right reasons. So it's just old oh hands. It's just thoughts, whispers from the shaitan. The same applies to when we have these issues and problems that we have. When we're overthinking, over worrying, putting ourselves down. We don't need to be. Finally, we should be from those that have pride. Okay? And we should be from those that have to cover in what? In the fact that we're Muslims. The fact that you are a Muslim, afwal shay, the best thing and the best blessing that Allah Azza wa Jalla Jalla will bless each and every one of us here today and all those Muslims is the fact that He blessed us with Islam. Okay, so even just by itself, have that thing where you have that self confidence because you're a Muslim. And inshallah, you being a Muslim, there's an opportunity for you to enter paradise. May Allah Azza wa Jalla make us from them. Now, this here in itself, Knowing that you are a Muslim and realizing it should be the main reason why you don't let thoughts get to you. You don't let them become more than just thoughts. If you're not able to recite the Quran because the shaitan has made you whisper, you know, whisper to you and convince you that yes, you need to think about these things day in, day out, then you're not going to be able to cure yourself. A lot of these things that we have, unfortunately, we forget that Allah mentions in the Quran, Allah bi dhikrillahi taqma'inu al the best thing is the Qur'an, and we should know the best of remembrance, that which the hearts find tranquility, is the Qur'an. So once you're able to know this, and Allah mentioned the Qur'an, the one that created the seven heavens and the earth and everything, the one that seeks, the one that sees to all, literally sees to all the problems. When someone makes dua, if you want to make dua right now, Allah will be able to answer our du'as. This shows us the power of Allah Jalla Jalla. So we should know and remind ourselves that Allah the Almighty is able to cure anything that we have, but we just have to go back. We've been, you know, subjected from the West and the media and whatever it may be in schools that we need to go to see a, you know, a therapist, we need to go to a doctor. He's going to give us the cure. There, there is the cure. All of these things are just taking you away from the deen, the fitrah, which is that we have to return to Allah Jalla Jalla when we have our problems. Another thing is we should know that when you do have a problem and you do have an issue, it's good to talk about it with someone else that you trust. And when you do so, it helps. Because when you keep quiet about something that you're going through, it doesn't matter what it is, then it's not going to get any better. Of course, after you've made the right to Allah Azza wa Jalla and you've had full reliance, then try your utmost best to surround yourselves with those companions that are good and are going to advise you correctly. Because there are some that may really be close to you, but they're not going to advise you in the correct manner. So remember, number one, it's just a thought. Okay? A thought can be killed and it can be taken away if you don't give in to the shaitan and give in to your own thoughts. So fight yourself. Okay? And remember, and it links back to the first hadith I mentioned, that your soul and your body has a right over you. So by you giving in to these thoughts, you're leading your own self to destruction. Because you're not going to be able to worship Allah as well. You're not going to be able to just even enjoy your own day-to-day -day life. You're not going to be able to enjoy your own day-to-day -day life. Which means you're going to be distracted from many things that are goodness. Once you've done that, and you're able to not give in to that thought, try and do something that helps relieve stress, or depression, or anxiety, or anything that's on your mind. Some people it's exercise, like boxing, or Maybe some people is sightseeing or traveling or it could be whatever it could be that's halal, try your utmost best to do so. And that will help you be able to find this. And not just that, but the person is upon the origin of his companion. So if you know this, try and have that circle that you have around you to be of positivity. Literally just have positive friends around you. Because they're going to be the ones that will be able to aid you and you'll be able to lean on them when you are suffering with these things. And as he mentioned and he advised each and every one of us, that, that one should keep his tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal. And when he does so, then he will be able to get closer to Allah and make dua. So inshallah we'll conclude in that hadith. And we should remember and know that this hadith in itself, it was from a companion, narrated by a companion, Abdullah ibn Busrin. He said that 
a beggar came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a man, and he said to him that, I see that the laws of Islam, Shara' al Islam is you know, it's heavy upon me. It's heavy and bur burdensome upon me. It's too much. I can't take it. So he said to the Prophet, sallam, tell me of something that I'll be able to adhere to, that I'll be able to do and keep up. Just tell me of something. He wanted a solution from the Messenger. Sallam. Many of us we do get to that stage where it's just too much. All of these things I have to do, I have to pass in Ramadan, I have to pray five times a day. But what did the Prophet sallam, say to him? He said, always keep your tongue moist with the remembrance of Allah. If you do that, always remember that you, every single blessing you have in this world is from Allah. And everything that is difficult that you may have, Allah is not doing it because He hates you. Allah is not doing it because He wants you to be led to destruction, but rather He wants to test you. Okay, so remember, we may go through these things, but we just have to think back and know that there is a solution, and Islam is the solution. وآخر دعوانا عن الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خير خير الجزاء وأحسن الله إليكم